Chapter Ten of the Apostle of Alaska: The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Peculiar customs. Both the men and women of this nation in olden times wore rings in their noses and rings or shells in their ears. The men of rank often wore a number of them in the ears the women of rank were provided with a labrette or ornament of bone inlaid with abalone shell two or three inches long and up to an inch wide which was inserted in an opening in the chin it came about in this way when a girl reached the age of puberty she was shut up by herself either in a hut in the forest or in a separate enclosure in the house for a period of about six months during this period when no one except her mother was allowed to see her a slit was cut parallel with her lower lip and a little below it in this slit was inserted a piece of bone the slit was gradually made larger and a larger ornament inserted the larger a woman's labrette the higher her rank slaves were not allowed to wear them at all a Timshian woman would never think of appearing before a strange man or in company without her labrette should she accidentally do so she would feel as embarrassed as would one of our ladies to-day who might be surprised in undress when the six months were over it was claimed that she had come back from the moon a feast was held for her and property was given away when the guests were all gathered in the house a curtain was withdrawn and the maiden was shown sitting surrounded by the coppers of the family or the tribe and commenced to sing a song Footnote coppers are large engraved and hammered shields of native copper heirlooms and very costly possessions End footnote. this constituted the young lady's coming out she was now marriageable her marriage was proceeded with as follows the young girls are kept very strictly they must be modest and never look at a young man outside the house they could appear only with the mother or an older sister there was therefore a very limited chance for flirtation or even courtship when a young man desired to marry the young lady he consulted with his parents or perhaps it is more correct to say that they consulted with him when they had found some one they wanted him to marry as the mother of a young man was usually the one who looked around to find a suitable bride for him the mother then went to the parents of the girl and told them she would like their daughter for her son if they would agree the girl's parents never gave an answer right away that would look as if they were anxious to get rid of her after listening to what the boy's mother had to say they without committing themselves in any way told her that they would consult their relatives on the subject this ended the meeting after a few moons the boy's mother would again call on the girl's parents if their answer was favorable they would now suggest that the young people wait a year so as to see if they behaved themselves and that they would not shame their folks the engagement thus being settled without the intervention of the young people the boy's mother brought a present to the girl's mother perhaps a basket full of cedar bark torn up like fine oakum which they used for toweling or something of that sort when the wedding day finally had been fixed the young man's father and uncles visited the girl's father and mother and gave them presents generally canoes slaves and mats that is they did not bring them along but promised them by placing a stick in front of the father if they meant to give a canoe and a stone if they meant a slave if this offering was deemed sufficient the recipient would nod his head and that settled the matter this was really the purchase price which the boy's family paid for the girl on the wedding day the young man is seated on a mat in the house of the girl's parents with his parents and uncles the girl's mother would then go to the house where the girl is kept bring her in leading her by the hand and take her over to the mat where the young man sits she then seated herself on the mat at his side but without either taking his hand or even speaking to him this was the whole marriage ceremony the procession would now start for the young man's home if he had no house of his own his home from that time was with his maternal uncle not with his father in the procession the bridegroom went first then the bride then his relatives and lastly hers a feast was now given to the relatives and later on one to the leading men of the village it was now the bride's parents turn to give presents 
the father generally presenting them with a supply of food the mother with spoons and other household utensils when a child came the girl's mother gave presents to the mother of the young man when a man died his children went to their mother's oldest brother to live and became his children the dead man's property all descended to his oldest sister's oldest son so did the widow whom he had to marry and this whether he had a wife already or not if he did not want to marry her he must give her an indemnity when she could marry some one else when a young man in this manner got an old wife it was not unusual for him to take a young one also about the same time except in these particular cases polygamy was not practiced before duncan came to these people they cremated their dead the only exception was in the case of the medicine man who perhaps was considered too tough to burn and who were placed in a sitting position in a box which was either hidden among the branches of a tall tree or deposited on a prominent rock in some lonely spot at the funeral this was the procedure the box containing the corpse was placed on a mat in the centre of the floor the widow and children blackened their faces with charcoal or black paint cut their hair short put on the poorest and worst clothing they had took some old mats which had been thrown away and made headdresses of them they then formed a procession the widow leading then the children according to their ages after which came the relatives then all marched around the box if the deceased was a chief they sang their famous lemkoi or funeral dirge this is never sung save at the funeral of a chief and is so sad and melancholy that a strong man is always chosen to lead it as most of the people break into violent weeping during the singing if it was not a chief's funeral an incessant wailing was kept up as long as the corpse was in the house after a proper amount of wailing the box containing the body was taken out and placed in the centre of a pile of wood back of the house and burned the bones remaining were picked up ground into dust and placed in a small box which if the deceased had a totem pole was preserved in an opening in the back part of the pole if not the ashes were sometimes placed in a mortuary column erected for the deceased some time after his death but as both totem poles and mortuary columns were the exception rather than the rule with the Chimpsians, in most cases no further attention was paid to the ashes of the dead after the cremation the Tsimsheans were very hospitable the arrival of a stranger was always the signal for immediately setting before him of the best which the house could afford the winter season was one continuous round of feasting now one chief then another made a feast and every imaginable pretext was made use of as an excuse for a feast and this not only to give them a chance to show their hospitality but just as much to furnish an opportunity to show off if there was anything that the Tsimsheans prized more than a parade and display of what they had it must have been the observation of the strictest rules of etiquette they were worse sticklers on etiquette than the lord chamberlain of a european imperial court if a boy should have his ears pierced or should assume a more important family name or should become what they call a principal at once each of these occasions called for a feast or rather several feasts and in the latter case also for a potlatch if a house was to be built there had to be four different feasts with plenty to eat placed before the guests in big boxes sometimes in small canoes and it all had to be eaten too or at least taken away these feasts were distributed during the course of two years but after the last feast must come a great potlatch which consisted in the host making his guests presents of all he had in the world of personal property we will witness such a potlatch given by a noted simchian chief the more display that can be made and the more property given away the greater the glory is reflected on the tribe therefore all the members of his tribe present to him for days all that they possess coppers slaves canoes guns blankets furs of all kinds nets mats kettles bracelets necklaces rings headdresses masks calico dress goods hats moccasins and all other things fit to give away the first parade and display is now made of what these good people give to their chief for him to give away to others the day before the great potlatch they exhibit their gifts publicly 
hundreds of yards of calico and cotton goods are flapping in the breeze hung from house to house furs are nailed to the doors blankets and elk skins are carried along the beach by carriers walking in single file the cotton and calico is then brought down to the beach the farther away from the chief's house the better unrolled to its full length a bearer is then secured for about every three yards and now it is carried in triumph to the chief's house that and all the other presents are to be his now his people have impoverished themselves but in another day he will not be much better off all of theirs and all of his will then be gone he and his chief counsellors and his wife are already apportioning this new property brought to him among those who are to be his guests on the morrow the great day comes and with it the chiefs and leading men of the other tribes and sometimes of other nations or settlements but not one of the chief's friends in his own tribe if they are present it is only as spectators to witness the great sight not a yard of calico or an ounce of powder is given to any of them the chief is seated at the chief's seat the other great chiefs around him sitting according to their rank a herald announces the article the chief who continuously consults a bundle of memorandum sticks in his hand announces the name of the recipient and with great pomp the gift is delivered though the next morning the chief is as poor as when he came into the world the fact does not bother him a bit for he has experienced the glory of a potlatch which will be spoken of for many moons but do not think for a moment that he is actuated by a desire to realize the beautiful sentiment it is more blessed to give than to receive far from it that suffices for his poor tribes people who now have to go to work to replenish their exhausted exchequer by hard labor excessive industry and hard-fisted economy and who have no other means of regaining their lost property not so for the chief his giving away property is not given away at all it is the tsimshian way of banking and life insurance molded into one he never gives away anything which he is not sure to get back with interest at the next potlatch which that chief gives in fact these chiefs spend a good deal of their time in keeping track of what they have received from each chief at every potlatch and in calculating what they shall give to each in order to return an equivalent and a little more the home of the indian chief is not a convenient place to keep potted wealth in so he sets the ball rolling some of it is here and some there but as time goes on it comes back with a little more now from this chief and then again from another in other words his deposit in the bank is cashed out in smaller amounts as he needs it and a little interest is added for the use of it what more can he require as to this proceeding being in the nature of a life insurance as well let the following indicate the chief dies but his wife has the memo sticks and is posted on all his gifts and as to who is owing him and how much and no chief will dare to slight the nephew heir fail to invite him or to make him the suitable gift due to his ancestor for he well knows that the widow keeps a strict account and as she has married the heir she can keep him posted woe to the chief who failed to return the gift he owed songs would be made about him shaming him and he might just as well seek death at once life would be unendurable after such a deed he has been guilty of the unpardonable sin that is all it is even suggested that it is in order to enable the heir to keep track of these valuable claims that the tsimshian law requires the nephew to marry the widow although the wise men added that a young man and an old wife and an old man and a young wife should ever be the rule because then in both cases there is at least one wise person in the house it is in these potlatches and the contributions of the common people of the tribe to the chief's treasury we find the only vestige of taxes or salary paid by the people to their chiefs as a chief never does any manual labor he must of course find his living somewhere and here a way is pointed out for him to do so there was another way in which property was disposed of even more foolishly among these people it was this when one of them felt himself insulted or aggrieved by another he would in the presence of the other destroy his own canoe or other valuable property the other must then at the risk of being shamed out of countenance by the people destroy the same article belonging to himself 
then the first one destroys another article and he has to follow suit if he fails he is shamed and practically ostracized he certainly cannot show his face again in decent society many a man has in this way been absolutely ruined by a richer enemy gambling was the national vice of the timtians many of their legends have to do with men who gambled away all that they possessed slaves canoes coppers wife and children at all their festivities in fact on all possible occasions the indians painted their faces in a most horrible manner while they perhaps could find an excuse for doing so in their continuous exposure to the elements and to the attack of gnats and mosquitoes the real reason undoubtedly was that by painting their faces they desired to make themselves look as terror-striking as possible lex talionis was the supreme rule among the tsimsians as among all primitive peoples but retaliation among them took a peculiar form when a haida indian had killed a tsimshian the law was satisfied by killing the first haida they came across without regard to whether he or even his tribe had had anything to do with the killing of the tsimshian if the man killed was a chief two of the other nation had to pay for it with their lives then and then only was the slate wiped clean if one of the two killed in retaliation was a chief or leading man they had overshot the mark and some more killing was due but a murder like all other injuries could be settled for by paying an indemnity every imaginable injury had a fixed compensatory scheduled price in blankets it would sometimes bother a philadelphia lawyer to figure out the liability in these cases whether the wrongdoer intended his act or it was wholly accidental did not cut any figure at all except possibly as to the amount of the compensation if an indian shot at my decoy and thereby lost his cartridge i was bound to pay him the price of the cartridge it has even been held that the owner of a stolen rifle had to pay indemnity to the relatives of the burglar who stole it and accidentally shot himself with it for his death if a man is attacked by a savage dog and kills him in self-defense he must pay the owner for the dog a small trading schooner in a furious gale once rescued two indians from a sinking canoe which had been carried out to sea the canoe was so large that it could neither be carried nor towed and the natives themselves cut the worthless craft adrift when the captain landed the men at their village they demanded of him payment for the canoe we cannot blame him for not seeing it in that light but still it was a perfectly correct position to take from the tsimshian point of view if a child is killed the indemnity goes to its mother's brother not to the father a native by an unfortunate accident once killed his own son and had to pay indemnity for his life to his wife's brother or be killed himself to balance the account a short time before duncan's arrival the fort came near being destroyed by fire the smoke-house directly back of the men's quarters had caught fire and before it was discovered all of that part of the fort was in flames during the excitement some two hundred indians had come into the fort helping to carry water from the sea finally one of them suggested carrying a canoe up on the gallery and fill it with water and when full tip it over the building on fire this was done and undoubtedly saved the fort from destruction when the fire had been put out the indians refused to leave claiming that the fort belonged to them now inasmuch if it had not been for them it would have been burned the issue would perhaps have been doubtful if the captain had not succeeded in bribing one of the chiefs who made a speech and induced them to give up their claim this chief forever afterwards went by the name of spokes a title well earned by his effective argument until their contamination by the whites the tsimsheans stood high in the moral scale they were well known all over that part of the country for their honesty and uprightness theft was entirely unknown among them they had no intoxicating liquor of their own and did not know what intoxication was until the white men brought the curse among them and taught them how to distill the hoochinoo the vilest concoction imaginable with the fire water came destruction to both soul and body of the poor victims the tsimsheans did raise a kind of substitute for tobacco which they did not however use for smoking only for chewing before the white men came among them lapses from virtue on the part of their women were practically unknown unfaithfulness on the part of a wife was punished by death 
the injured husband executing the law himself and in addition collecting a heavy indemnity from the partner in her crime or taking revenge upon him by killing him when the whites came to the coast the sobriety and honesty of the men and the purity of the women soon vanished after a while it became the fashion for the tsimsheans to bring their wives daughters and nieces by the canoe load to victoria where they would rent them out for prostitution without in any manner perceiving the moral obliquity of the act did not the white people do it when duncan had been at the fort for a year or two an indian one day came to him quite excited and wanted him to go for some men on a schooner in the harbor when duncan asked him why he coolly said they have had my two wives on board all night and will not pay for them you scamp you why did you let your wives go because they promised to pay me for them it is needless to say that mr duncan did not go for them instead that particular indian received the finest tongue lashing he had ever had through the influence and evil example of many bad white men the tsimsheans had been hurled from the lofty position of happiness and innocence which they had once occupied through the loving influence and god-fearing example of one white man they were to be again restored to the heights where they once soared and that from the deepest depths of degradation end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schemp. the totems and clubs we have already seen that the twenty three hundred simpsians living at fort simpson were divided into nine different tribes living each in their own separate village close by each other but the bond of the Tsimshean nation was not the only one uniting the different tribes. In every tribe were found members of the same four different clans or crests, the ties and relations of these clans being much more intimate and binding than the tribe relation. The name given to this relation is totem. We find it not only permeating the Tsimshean nation, but also all the other Indian communities on the northwest coast with practically the identical crests in each. Yea, we are told that the same clan division is found among the aborigines in the southern sea, as well as among some of the natives of the South American continent. The forest of totem poles which greets the eye of the traveler all along the coast of southeastern Alaska, and which, by their grotesque carving and painting, furnish so great an attraction to him, is an outcropping and an evidence of the existence of this clan or crest system all around him at first the white people were inclined to look at the totem poles as idols and believed them to be objects of worship on the part of the indians but herein they were clearly mistaken the designs on them were simply symbolical of the crests adopted in far back ages to distinguish the four social clans into which each tribe was divided and the totem pole in reality is a substitute for the coat of arms of the european nobleman the use of the totem pole never became common among the tsimsheans while the haidas the expert carvers of the coast were especially noted for their complex sets of totem poles and were closely followed by the clingets the illustration on a nearby page gives an idea of the forest of totem poles in a haida village at fort simpson the headquarters of the tsimshean nation there were never at any time more than eight or ten totem poles all told the tsimsheans instead sometime painted the animals of their totems on the front wall of their houses and every household utensil and treasure chest as well as every box in which the winter food was stored bore upon it evidences of the family's totem carved or painted as the case might be as it is important on a subject like this to have an authoritative explanation and as no man on the northwest coast could be a more absolute authority on everything in connection with the indians than mr duncan i will reproduce what he has written on the totem subject in the metlakatlan number four for the month of november eighteen eighty nine the names of the four clans in the tsimshean language are kishputwada kanada lachabu and lakshkik the kishpuwara 
by far the most numerous hereabouts are represented symbolically by the grizzly bear on land the finback whale in the sea the owl in the air and the rainbow in the heavens the kanata symbols are the frog the raven the starfish and the bullhead the lachabu take the wolf and heron for totems the lakshkeek the beaver the eagle the halibut and the dogfish the creatures i have just named are however only regarded as the visible representatives of the powerful and mystical beings or genii of indian mythology and as all of one group are said to be of the same kindred so all the members of the same clan whose heraldic symbols are the same are counted as blood relations strange to say this relationship holds good should the persons belong to different or even hostile tribes speak a totally different language or be located thousands of miles apart on being asked to explain how this notion of relationship originated or why it is perpetuated in the face of so many obliterating circumstances the indians point back to a remote age when their ancestors lived in a beautiful land and where in some mysterious manner the creatures whose symbols they retain revealed themselves to the heads of the families of that day they then relate the traditional story of an overwhelming flood which came and submerged the good land and spread death and destruction all around those of the ancients who escaped in canoes were drifted about and scattered in every direction on the face of the waters and where they found themselves after the flood had subsided there they located and formed new tribal associations thus it was that persons related by blood became widely scattered from each other nevertheless they retained and clung to the symbols which had distinguished them and their respective families before the flood and all succeeding generations have in this particular sacredly followed suit hence it is that the crests have continued to mark the offspring of the original founders of each family as it may be interesting to know to what practical uses the natives apply their crests i will enumerate those which have come under my own notice one as i have previously mentioned crests subdivide tribes into social clans and a union of crest is a closer bond than a tribal union two it is the ambition of all leading members of each clan in the several tribes to represent by carving or painting their heraldic symbols on all their belongings not omitting even their household utensils as spoons and dishes and on the death of the head of the family a totem pole is often erected in front of his house by his successor on which is carved and painted more or less elaborately the symbolic creatures of his clan as they appear in some mythological tale or legend three the crests define the bonds of consanguinity and persons having the same crests are forbidden to intermarry that is a frog may not marry a frog nor a whale marry a whale but a frog may marry a wolf and a whale may marry an eagle among some of the alaskan tribes i am told the marriage restrictions are still further narrowed and persons of different crests may not intermarry if the creatures of their respective clans have the same instincts thus the kanata may not marry a lakshkeek because the raven of the one crest and the eagle of the other seek and devour the same kind of food again the kishputwada may not marry a lachabo because the grizzly bear and wolf representing those crests are both carnivorous four all the children take the mother's crest and are incorporated as members of the mother's family nor do they designate or regard their father's family as their relations a man's heir and successor therefore is not his own son but his sister's son and in the case of a woman being married into a distant tribe away from her relations the offspring of such union when grown up will leave their parents and go to their mother's tribe and take their respective places in their mother's family this law accounts for the great interest which natives take in their nephews and nieces which seems to be quite equal to the interest they take in their own children five the clan relationship also regulates all feasting a native never invites the members of his own crest to a feast they being regarded as his blood relations are always welcome as his guests but at feasts which are given only for display so far from being partakers of the bounty all the clansmen within a reasonable distance 
are expected to contribute of their means and their services gratuitously to make the feast a success on the fame of the feast hangs the honor of the clan six this social brotherhood has a great deal to do with promoting hospitality among the indians a matter of immense importance in a country without hotels or restaurants a stranger with or without his family in visiting an indian village need never be at a loss for shelter all he has to do is to make for the house belonging to one of his crest there he is sure of a welcome and of the best the host can afford there he is accounted a brother and treated and trusted as such seven the subdivision of the tribes into their social clans accounts in a measure for the number of petty chiefs existing in each tribe as each clan can boast of its head men the more property a clan can accumulate and give away to rival clans the greater number of head men it may have eight another prominent use made by the natives of the heraldic symbols is that they take names from them for their children for instance weenayak big fin whale litum Loktau, sitting on the ice eagle ikshkoam alya the first speaker in the morning raven ath kaukaut the howler traveling wolf nine and last but not least the kinship claimed and maintained in each tribe by the method of cress has much to do with preventing blood feuds and also in restoring peace when quarrels and fighting have arisen tribes or sections thereof may and do fight but members of the same social clan may not fight hence in contests between two tribes there always remain in each some non-combatants who will watch the opportunity to interpose their good offices in the interests of peace and order in case too of a marauding party being out to secure slaves should they find one or more of their victims to be of their own crest such a person would be set free and be incorporated as a member of their family while the captives of other crests would be held or sold as slaves in writing of these matters it must be understood that i have kept in view the natives in their primitive state the metlakatlans who are civilized while retaining their crest distinctions and upholding the good and salutary regulations connected therewith have dropped all the baneful and heathenish rivalry with which the clannish system was intimately associated besides this intertribal clan division there was also what we may for want of a better word be denominated as a club or lodge division into secret social fraternities about one half of the population at fort simpson belonged to one or the other of three such organizations those who did not were called amget the names of the three clubs were wiadaha haliad or the cannibals nuklam or the dog eaters mikla or those who did not eat at all but only practiced dancing and singing only members of the kithando and the kithratla tribes were eligible for membership in the cannibal club but to the other two membership was open to any member of any tribe the initiation of new members into these orders or clubs was carried on during the winter months with the most disgusting ceremonies and mostly in the open but if any one came upon the members of the club while engaged in their secret work in the forest he was compelled to become a member whether he wanted to or not the initiation was generally under the direction of some old experienced medicine man but those who were made to ride the goat were young men and sometimes boys who before the public ceremonies had to pass several days and nights alone in the forest where they were supposed to receive supernatural gifts enabling them to go through the ordeal awaiting them the proceedings in the different clubs partook of the same general character i will let mr duncan speak early in the morning the pupils would be out on the beach or on the rocks in a state of nudity each had a place in front of his own tribe nor did intense cold interfere in the slightest degree after the poor creature had crept about jerking his head and screaming for some time a party of men would rush out and after surrounding him commence singing the dog-eating party occasionally carried a dead dog to their pupil who forthwith commenced to tear it in the most dog-like manner 
the party of attendants kept up a low growling noise or a whoop which they seconded by a screeching noise made on an instrument which they believed to be the abode of a spirit in a little time the naked youth would start up again and proceed a few more yards in a crouching posture with his arms pushed out behind him and tossing his flowing black hair all the while he is earnestly watched by the group about him and when he pleases to sit down they again surround him and commence singing this kind of thing goes on with several different additions for some time before the prodigy finally retires he takes a turn into every house belonging to his tribe and is followed by his train when this is done in some cases he has a ramble on the tops of the same houses during which he is anxiously watched by his attendants as if they expected his flight by and by he condescends to come down and they then follow him to his den which is marked by a rope made of red bark hung over the doorway so as to prevent any person from ignorantly violating its precincts none are allowed to enter the house but those connected with the art all i know therefore of their further proceedings is that they keep up a furious hammering singing and screeching for hours during the day of all these parties none are so much dreaded as the cannibals one morning i saw from the gallery hundreds of tsimsians sitting in their canoes which they had just pushed away from the beach i was told that the cannibal party was in search of a body to devour and if they failed to find a dead body it was probable they would seize the first living one that came in their way so that all the people living near to the cannibal's house had taken to their canoes to escape being torn to pieces the cannibal when about to go through the rites of initiation is generally supplied with one or more human bodies which he tears to pieces with his teeth before his audience several persons either from bravado or as a charm present their arms for him to bite i have seen several who have been thus bitten it has been claimed that the cannibals at these rites actually devour human bodies and the dog-eaters the flesh of dogs mr duncan himself once believed that they did so but i am happy to be able to say that a thorough investigation and a most searching cross-examination of several tsimsians who have themselves in their youth belonged to the dog-eating club there are no formal members of the cannibal club at metlakatla now living has convinced me that these indians are entitled to be acquitted of this heinous charge they never of this i feel certain did eat either human flesh or dog meat it is perhaps bad enough that they even pretended to do so with their teeth they tore the flesh from the bones acted as if they chewed it and pretended to swallow it but they invariably got rid of it after having kept it in the mouth for a while this was well known to the crowd that surrounded the novice and who with their bodies hid him from view when he spewed out and got rid of the flesh in his mouth so that the uninitiated among the people did not see that and therefore honestly believed that he actually ate human flesh or raw dog meat as the case might be on other occasions they had deer meat which they by some trick or sleight of hand performance substituted for the human flesh just before the critical moment the object of the rites of both of these clubs was of course to fill the people with terror at their pretended ferocity all this club work as well as the medicine work mentioned in the next chapter was called by the indians haliad the greater portion of the membership of these clubs was made up of men and boys approaching maturity but there were also a few female members in each club end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil shemp the medicine men the shuwanch the tsimshian name for a medicine man not shaman as is frequently erroneously given was a most important character in the tsimshian as in every other indian community he was not in a strict sense the doctor of the tribe the use of herbs both as potions and as applications for wounds and swellings was wholly in the hands of some wise old woman they were especially successful in the treatment of wounds 
and that in spite of the fact that their surgery was not very antiseptic the shoe wanch was generally called in to heal only when some one got sick without any readily explainable cause for it and when therefore the lively indian imagination was prone to suspect that some one had bewitched the party for the shoon wanch was an exorciser and able to drive out the evil spirits that had taken possession of the poor suffering body he then came with his rattle and rattled over the sick man who had to be wholly naked during the performance so that the evil spirits should not be able to hide in his clothes but get away readily there he would work away rattle for dear life dance about with wild gesticulations blow in the patient's mouth and nostrils pound and knead his body chant swing to and fro froth at the mouth and shout and shriek till the patient said he was better when the medicine man with great earnestness and show replaced in the body his soul which he claimed to have caught in the act of leaving it and to have incarcerated in a little hollow bone tube which the medicine man invariably carried on a string around the neck they claimed to be able to see people's souls travelling about in the open air in the shape of flies with long sharp bills and often were observed when walking about to grab for something and solemnly put it away in his hollow bone carefully closing the cover that was some one's soul that they had caught and imprisoned and the unfortunate person now had to pay a good price to get his poor wandering soul back again if the medicine man did not do a first-class job he had to return the blankets or other price he had received for his services sometimes he might praise his luck if he did not have to give up his life if the patient died generally when the case was a serious one his excuse was that someone had bewitched the party if he gave the name of that person he cleared his own skirts it was generally some man of small importance a poor decrepit old woman or a slave who was thus denounced as exercising the power of the evil eye the following story told me by mr duncan will give an idea of the modus operandi in such a case the old chief of the ketlans neosh lak kanush was sick in bed for a long time with an extremely malignant carbuncle he sent for a medicine man of the tsimsheans but received no help there was then a medicine man of great renown among the clinkets at tongas called neashot he was sent for and came he rattled over the old chief for a long time but no improvement was perceived he finally as usual suggested that the chief had been bewitched some one had got hold of some of his clothing and had buried it with a corpse at a graveyard far away if it did not get away from the grave the old man would die what they must do was to get the clothes away from the grave at once and then kill the sorcerer some one was immediately dispatched for the clothes he came back with something which the old chief recognized as having belonged to him it was all a case of make-believe the messenger never had been near either a grave or a corpse he was simply in league with the medicine man upon his return the medicine man whispered solemnly in the chief's ear nishes is the man who has brought this upon you you must kill him if you wish to get well nishes was a weak old man who trembled on the verge of the grave he did not belong to the kitlan tribe but lived a quarter of a mile up the beach he was sent for and came as indians always do without asking the why or the wherefore when he came in food was of course set before him while he was eating the chief was lying in bed with a loaded pistol in his hand under the blanket fully determined to shoot and kill him as soon as he had finished his meal one of the chief's counsellors whispered to him don't kill nishis don't kill him ask him to pity you the chief dropped the pistol and addressed him nishis have pity on me have mercy on me save me what do you mean save me i don't understand you you have sent this disease upon me pity me save me have mercy on me i have suffered so much you are mistaken i have nothing against you i never had yes you have you have done it but now pity me 
it is a great big lie and in a huff the old man left the house the old chief got well and after he was converted to christianity he often told mr duncan that he was very glad he had not killed the old man he would say i know it well the medicine men are all liars how awful it would have been if i had murdered the poor old man and should have had that on my conscience now in order to obtain his commission as a blower the medicine man or woman for there were some medicine women also had to show some miraculous power this they always managed to do by some trick or deceit an old medicine woman after her conversion showed mr duncan how she had convinced the people of her power to perform a miracle she had a nice little round green stone which had been picked up on the beach producing a vessel filled with water she asked the people present if they could get her little green stone to float in the water they all tried but for every one of them it sank of course then she took the vessel and lo there the stone floated all right enough that was sufficient to show her supernatural power but how was it done simply enough she had a twin sister to the stone made of wood and in taking hold of the vessel she clandestinely substituted that for the stone that was all a favorite way of showing supernatural power was to kill some one and restore them to life again one medicine man showed his power by one evening cutting off the chief's head the head rolled to the floor and while the blood was squirting hither and thither it jumped from one end of the room to the other in fact it was a most lively head it is no wonder that the indians present died but still greater was their amazement when the medicine man put the head back on the body which had rolled over on its side and after fumbling with it for a while smearing the cut with some health restoring salve and grease exhibited the chief in his normal condition speaking laughing and dancing as if he had never lost his head at all the miracle is explained easily enough when it is considered that the chief was an accomplice there was a false head put above his own which latter was concealed by his blanket by operating a set of strings the false head which was provided with bags containing blood was made to jump around the floor when the false head was pretended to be put back again it was in reality hidden in the folds of the blanket while the chief's real head made its appearance and commenced to talk another medicine man had a big box in which he put water and then dropped in red-hot stones so as to make the water boil after he had put the lid on again when it was boiling he opened the box and the steam poured out he then lifted up the chief and threw him into the box and put the lid on again the people heard the chief's voice inside the box crying with pain first very strongly and then a little weaker and still weaker till you could hardly hear it at all then it ceased altogether the medicine man now waited quite a while so that the chief would be boiled very thoroughly then he started to open the lid when suddenly the chief's voice was heard very strongly and distinctly coming from the forest away back of the house when the box was opened there was no chief there but a great mass of eagle feathers which the medicine man scattered around the house nor was there any water or stones in the box any more in two or three minutes the chief came in through the door and did not look as if he had been parboiled at all the secret is readily explained there was a false bottom in the box one end of which stood up against the edge of the platform this end of the box was open or had a trap door so the chief after having spoken inside until it was about time for him to die could crawl out of the box through this opening and then under the platform into the open it is said that every prominent family in the different tribes had its own trick which was its secret known only to the chief and his counsellors it was part of the official business of the latter to instruct the new chief in the secrets of the family the awe in which the medicine men were held by the common people was very remarkable when mr duncan after he had commenced to get a following ridiculed the medicine men and their practices his adherents begged of him to be careful and not to aggravate them and when he laughed at this they used to say oh it is because you don't know you don't know again and again they would beg him not to put himself in their power when you cut your hair be sure to burn it all up so they will not get hold of any of it and bewitch you again when you spit 
don't spit on the ground you must spit up in the air if they find some of your spittle they will make you sick and you will die oh you don't know mr duncan in order to show them that he was not afraid told them that the next time he cut his hair he would send a lock of it to every medicine man in the camp so that they could have some to work on his friends were awestruck at his recklessness and could not be persuaded but that he took very serious risks one medicine man did get hold of an old paper collar which had belonged to mr duncan he placed it up in a tree and used to go around the tree two or three times a day exercising his rattle upon it in order to send a throat trouble upon mr duncan as mr duncan suffers from a dry hacking cough due to some chronic trouble in the bronchial tubes i suggested that this medicine man's actions might perhaps explain the chronic throat trouble with a merry twinkle in his eyes mr duncan answered so it might yes only for the fact that i suffered from that trouble long before he got hold of my old paper collar it is surprising to see what a hold the influence of these medicine men has taken on the tsimshian people one of the most intelligent of the metlakatla indians who was converted in his early youth and therefore got away from their heathenish influences before they could have had a chance to take very deep root in him told me the following story with all evidences of belief in the supernatural powers of the medicine men in fact he stated that he did not know what to believe but that he knew for certain that what he told me was the truth once my uncle who was a great sea otter hunter he said had gone on a hunting trip with four men in his canoe when he was gone there came up an awful storm and great big waves he was gone many weeks when he did not come back our people thought he was drowned they went to the medicine man he danced then he told them to take a stick of wood and go down to the beach it was then low tide and to put it in the ground where he told them to they did so further he cried again further finally he shouted now there put it down hit it hard so it will stay there when done he said when the tide comes to that point the men will all come back again the people laughed they were sure they were dead long ago but nevertheless though they did not believe in it they waited for the tide and watched anxiously and lo and behold just as the tide reached the stick on the beach a canoe came around the point and all the five men were in it they had had no food for many days and were almost starved the people gave them food and they all came out all right that the tsimsheans are open to reason in other matters and do not simply accept all that they hear even if it has the sanction of age and tradition appears from the following experience of mr duncan and is given to show that when faith in the supernatural power of the medicine men still clings to them to some extent it must be due to a most extraordinary cleverness on the part of these deceivers coming down nos river mr duncan was invited by an indian chief to go and see in the forest a village which their ancestors had inhabited it was a very long journey but they finally came to a beautiful spot a basin with high mountains all around except where the trail to the river went the chief told him where you now stand our old chief's house once stood i would like to tell you what our old people say and find out if it is true they say the chief's son a little child one night cried for water the mother was lazy and would not get up and get it for him the moon then came down into the room and asked the boy why he cried he then told the boy to come with him i will give you what you want the boy took his hand and he took him with him into the heavens the next morning there was a great cry when it was found that the boy was gone they hunted everywhere for him the next night they saw him in the moon with his little basket in his hand what do you think of it do you think it is true that the boy could get up there mr duncan would not say that it was false he knew too much for that he pointed up to the mountain top and to the pines up there and said to the chief those big pines up there are one hundred fifty feet high and they look like little plants now do you think that you could see a little boy up there and more especially see his basket oh no you could not see him at all well then how do you think you could see a boy and especially his basket in the moon 
which is many thousand miles further off than yonder mountain top well how our old folks could lie could they not that would do for him to say not for mr duncan end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf. the religion of the tsimsheans whenever a tsimshean saw a phenomenon in nature as a precipice a tidal wave etc he considered it a spirit a god and sacrificed a piece of salmon or something to propitiate the spirit but these were only sub-deities he recognized the great spirit above them all a good spirit the heavenly chief his name for heavenly chief was shumogat lehaga the first word being the word used for chief generally as chief of a tribe and lehaga meaning literally above i cannot find any legend distinctly attributing to this heavenly chief either the creation of the world or of man except as far as the idea can be made out from the following two legends the first one related to me by john tate a very intelligent and lovable tsimshean indian of metlakatla who in his youth belonged to the dog-eating club really has more to do with earthquakes and the primitive indian idea of what causes this natural phenomenon but curtly recites the creation of the earth by the heavenly chief as if it were a well-known and established fact the moral certainty with which the once much mooted question of the earth being flat is established is amusing mr tate's story is the heavenly chief built the earth it was round but flat he had big piles at all the corners of the earth on which it rested as a house does but after a while the piles got rotten the heavenly chief had a big fat slave he tells him to put in new corner piles under the earth so that it shall not fall down he was very strong this slave he goes and gets new piles then he strikes with his big heavy hammer on one of the old piles to get it out of the way and he strikes so hard that the earth trembles that is how the earthquake comes the other legend has reference to the creation of man and runs as follows the heavenly chief once said whoever can first get a child the rock over there or that elderberry bush of that child shall man be the rock was a little slow so the elderberry bush became the first with child therefore man is weak and sickly and dies if the rock had come first man would have been like the rocks which nothing can destroy mr duncan says that at nas river an indian showed him the rock that tried but failed in the race they evidently believed that the heavenly chief was immortal that he observed all that was going on among men and that he frequently was angry and punished those who were bad they had very remarkable and advanced ideas about prayers as will be apparent from the following told me by edward k mather a prominent metlakatla indian long before mr duncan came our people knew and spoke of the heavenly chief before sitting down to meals the father of the family always took a small piece of the food and putting it on the fire burned it and said for thee o heavenly chief the first my grandfather used to tell me if i wanted anything very badly if i desired success or anything like that or if i was sick and wanted to get well to go alone out into the forest and speak to the heavenly chief about it he said i must be low in spirit poor in heart humble and meek and look up and ask the heavenly chief and i would get what i asked for sometimes when calamities were prolonged or thickened they became enraged against the heavenly chief and vented their anger against him raising their eyes and hands in savage wrath to heaven stamping their feet and saying to him you are a great slave this is the strongest term of reproach their language has it may be here noted that the tsimshean language has no expression for any kind of an oath when the tsimshean wants to swear he must have recourse to the english language like almost every people on the footstool they have several interesting legends about the great flood besides the one already given i record the following told me by mrs lucy a booth of metlakatla 
as it is somewhat different from the one recited by mr duncan given in another chapter a long time ago the tsimshean people lived far away from here and the people were very bad the heavenly chief did not like them and told them to be good but they did not care then he got angry and sent a big tide bigger than ever had been before and it rained heavily so much indeed that the people got their canoes out and the tide came up high so that all the mountains were under water except a big mountain peak near wrangell and there came a big storm and all the little canoes were swamped only the big ones got through and they tied them up to that peak and when it came low tide again the tsimsheans could not find their way back so they came south to nass river they had a distinct idea of a life after this their word for die is sever or part the same word which is used of a rope when it breaks under a strain they fed the dead for some time till they should be able to find food for themselves in the spirit land but this food was burned in front of the dead so as to give spirit food to the spirit they claimed that when a person was about to die he could see the great chiefs who had departed before him and who now seemed to stand ready to receive him even to the present day mr duncan well knows what they mean when they come to tell him that a sick person has seen somebody this is to them proof positive that he is dying when at an early day mr duncan asked them if they had any proof that the dead still lived they told him the following true story of the man with the wooden wife at old metlakatla lived a childless couple they loved each other very much and were always together whenever they could be everybody spoke of how much they loved each other once the man went out on a hunting trip he had been gone only three or four days and when he came back it was night and dark he saw a big fire at the chief's house and knew there must be a feast there but he was lonesome for his wife so he steered for the beach in front of his own house after pulling the canoe up he went into the house it was dark but at the fireplace he saw his wife sitting on a box he spoke to her but she did not answer him when he went up to the fireplace she turned her face away from him and when he spoke to her again she still did not answer he then felt very badly as he understood that his wife must have done something wrong and she dared not speak so he went out again pushed his canoe into the water and paddled about five or six miles when he landed and camped for the night but his heart was heavy and he did not sleep the next morning in paddling back to the village he met a canoe coming from there as is the custom of the people he stopped and asked them for news they told him that his wife was dead and that she had been cremated outside the chief's house the night before he was very sad for then he knew that it was his wife's spirit he had seen the night before and not herself as she was then dead after that he always lived alone and never married again though he was a young man after a while he got a block of wood and carved out of it an image of his wife sitting down on the box as he saw her that night and everybody said it was an exact likeness of her face and figure this wooden woman he kept with him in his house and also took her with him in his canoe wherever he went the tsimsians had very pronounced ideas of reincarnation and of what might be called soul transmigration numerous legends go to substantiate this claim one is to the effect that a woman had a relative who was shot in the breast in a fight shortly after she gave birth to a son with a red spot on his breast at the identical place where the relative had been shot she and her people were positive that the old man had come back to life again in that baby boy another woman had an uncle who died soon after she gave birth to a boy with a peculiar mark on his thumb like one which the uncle had sabasa a tsimshean chief had a brother killed in a fight by a blow from a spear which tore the flesh from his shoulder his niece shortly afterwards dreamed that she saw her uncle and soon after gave birth to a boy who had a mark on his arm like a wound in the same place where her uncle was fatally hurt but a more remarkable story is this the tsimsheans once made a raid on a village up skeena river and killed all the inhabitants only one man escaped he ran up into the mountains and was making his way to a neighboring village to tell the fate of his friends when he came to a clear lake on the top of the mountain being thirsty he took a drink and at once became unconscious 
the next thing he knew he was lying on his mother's lap a little baby he could not talk at all but he remembered well about the fight and about his running away it was then found out in some way that he really was the first man slain in the fight in order to test whether he really was that man he when he grew up went to dig in a place where he remembered to have buried some gambling tools shortly before the fight and right enough there he found them just where he had hidden them they also have a clear idea of a future punishment they think that a bad man is punished by getting food which is out of season for instance salmon after the proper season which no tsimshian will eat when he has his choice the tsimshian worships the moon when it comes forth in the night he holds up his hand and says allo kwatlia we can see you walking or you walk in our night mr duncan tells how he once witnessed an enactment of the moon's phases one night it was a dark and cloudy one as the tide was at its lowest one of the clubs of the Haliad congregated in a house and rushed to the shore with a great noise their noises are never yelling only but something different for different things like college yells i was out on the gallery of the fort and saw the shadows moving then appeared on the shore some distance from the gathering a moon at first it was at the quarter then it waxed larger until it was half then three quarters and then full then a man appeared in it i think that it was made of thin deerskin like parchment with a light inside the moon then pretended to move down towards the crowd at this all the indians commenced to cackle it sounded like the yelping of a pack of wolves all at once the man in the moon answered them i thought then the moon waned and finally disappeared altogether and the indians rushed back again to the house with horrible yells end of chapter 13chapter 14 of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. the son of the heavenly chief while legends showing the consciousness on the part of the savage mind of the existence of a supreme being are of more or less frequency among most aborigines i doubt whether any other heathen nation can produce evidences like those of the tsimsheans of a communication in some manner or form of the story of the white christ there are any number of their legends that occupy themselves with the mission on earth of the son of the heavenly chief and the characteristics of this god-sent friend of the people correspond so wonderfully with those of our blessed saviour that it hardly seems possible for them thus to have been able to picture the man of galilee just as he wandered about on earth if those who first drew the picture had not seen him with their own eyes or received their information from some one who had mrs booth a full-blooded tsimshian at metlakatla told me that her mother had related to her when a little girl the following at first it was entirely dark there was no light in the world the people could see nothing but were groping around in a continual night then the son of the heavenly chief came down to earth and the people complained to him that it was so dark he said he would help them and then light came he traveled around for a long time and helped the people in their trouble he was so kind and good and the people loved him very much but still more wonderful appears the story of the battle between good and evil as mr duncan who has given it to me calls the following legend two of the natives have independently of mr duncan and of each other related the same story with only enough slight variations in the phraseology to prove that they each had received it from a different source the story as told me by mr duncan runs as follows once there were only two villages of people in the world a great river flowing between them they were constantly at war and the feud was so strong that finally everybody in one of the villages was exterminated except an old woman named kowak and her daughter kowak was very anxious again to populate her extinguished village which could only be done by raising up children to her daughter but how was this to be done it was of course out of the question to marry her to any man in the inimical village 
and the men in that village were the only ones alive in the world so kowak turned to the animal kingdom she would spend her days and nights in the forest crying out incessantly who will marry kowak's daughter repeating it over and over again finally a little red squirrel peeped out from among the branches of a spruce and said good woman i will marry kowak's daughter well then son-in-law elect if you marry kowak's daughter what will be your aim in life to what will your energies be directed oh i will scramble up the trees and gather the cones and throw them down no son-in-law elect you will have to give up the idea of marrying kowak's daughter you will not fill the bill at all next came the bear the same question was put to him his answer was i will bellow and growl and scare everybody lie in wait for animals in the forest and kill them and catch the salmon as they are jumping up the stream the same reply was given to him the deer next and then others offered their services the inquiry and the answer were similar each animal showing that its aim in life would be only a selfish exhibition of its own narrow conception of the enjoyment of life and the satisfaction of its animal craving then as kowak cried in the forest one day there appeared before her a person in shining clothes with a beautiful face and kind lovely eyes it was the son of the heavenly chief i will marry kowak's daughter good woman said he o oh, beautiful prince heaven bless you who will marry kowak's daughter the same question was put to him he answered my aim in life will be to destroy the enemies of kowak's deserted village oh you are a man after my own heart you shall indeed marry kowak's daughter but my wife must go with me to heaven and live there i cannot leave her down here all right i expected that but may i not go with you i would so like to live near my only daughter all that is left me of family parents husband and children it will be so lonely for me here well that depends on yourself but i doubt that you will be able to do so still we will try he took his wife in his arms and told the mother to hold fast by his shoulders but as we rise up he said if you would go to heaven you must not look down look up or at me all the time if you look down once you will never get there up they rose slowly towards heaven but when they got up in the clouds the old lady could not help throwing just one glance down to earth and at once her hold on the prince loosened and she sank and sank and finally she landed in the branches of a tree and there she stuck fast and she now moaned from pain and repentance that is what you hear moaning in the branches of the trees when the wind blows by and by three beautiful sons came to the daughter they grew up and became stronger and more beautiful every day the time neared when their father wanted them to go down and destroy the inimical village in the preparation for this they built each a fine house one day one of the houses commenced to sink and it struck the earth with a great noise so did the next and the next in the morning the chief of the inimical village woke up and rubbed his eyes what do i not see smoke in kowak's deserted village what can it be he gathered his counsellors together to advise him what to do they determined to send a slave over there he went and came back filled with awe and gave the most vivid description of what he had found oh there are three fine men there they treated me splendidly they were so kind and nice and there are the finest houses you ever saw the council was again called together they then determined to send the three young men a challenge to come and gamble with them two of them accepted the challenge the third one refused to gamble but said he would come along anyway they came and the game commenced the one who took no part was especially a giant with strong muscles and fine arms they won the game the chief and his followers got mad and rose up to slay them then there was a great battle in the end every one was slain by the heavenly boys mr duncan's explanation of this legend is that it represents the battle between good and evil evil and sin first win it seems as if the good had no chance at all but then it becomes joined to the son of god 
he comes to redeem the world and help good in its battle against sin and evil the old lady when she sinks back to the earth represents the flesh which cannot overcome temptation and therefore cannot enter heaven's halls while the spirit of the good in man the bride is in the arms of christ and attains the blessings of heaven in the end comes the triumph of good over evil and the final uprooting of evil as a result of the union between christ and the spirit of man it is a beautiful legend said he when i first heard it it struck me that these indians must have had some information as to the christ we cannot explain how but the story of the saviour as we know it must have come to them in some mysterious way in order to show that they were not only thoroughly imbued with the meek and lowly disposition of the son of god and with the idea that he assumed when here the role of the servant to man but that they also had received a correct impression of his divine power evidencing itself in wonderful miracles i give the following story of tezoda the son of the heavenly chief as told by mrs joseph niashak a venerable old simshian woman residing at metlakatla who prides herself on being one of tezoda's direct descendants her story is as follows once a tsimshean chief and the one next to him in rank each had a daughter the chief's daughter was beautiful the other was lame and homely the chief kept his daughter shut up from everybody as he did not want her to marry any one of inferior rank so the heavenly chief took pity on the maiden and sent his son down to woo the fair one the name of the son of the heavenly chief was tezoda when he came down to earth he brought with him a slave named halach they camped in the bush outside the village and the first night tezoda went alone to visit the maiden now he was a wonder worker knock knock so he went into the girl's room through a knot hole in the wall the next night he sent halach in order to get his opinion of the girl as halach had no supernatural powers he had to get inside by slipping in after those who lived in the house he remained all night in the house this made the chief angry so he said that he and the girl should get married as the girl preferred him to tezoda she consented and the wedding took place at once now it was the custom that a son-in-law should get the wood and do other work for his father-in-law so halach was sent with a large canoe and a number of boys for firewood he brought back a very poor kind of wood so wet that when it was laid on the fire it put it out this made halach feel ashamed so he said he had a slave named tezoda in the bush back of the village whom he wished to have brought in to do the menial work so they fetched tezoda who came seemingly as a slave to his own former slave halach as a slave he had to sleep near the door during the night the chief's wife awoke and saw the place around where tezoda slept lighted up with a great white light so she made up her mind that he was no slave and thought she would watch him the next day tezoda was sent for firewood he took a big canoe and a number of women and started out on the way they saw a seal put its head out of the water and he asked them if they would like to have it they said they would but had no means of getting it he told them to hide their heads he then took a sling which he always carried and a stone out of his mouth and hit the seal on the head and killed it the women were pleased and from that time tezoda began to be famous he asked them if they did not want a big tree for wood but they said they could not cut it down with their stone adzes so he told them to hide their heads again and he struck the tree with a stone from his sling it fell breaking into pieces just the right length and he piled the whole tree into the canoe so that when they got back all the people turned out to see a canoe carry so big a load and they filled up the house with wood so full of pitch that it burned like grease so halach was ashamed of himself also his wife was sorry that she had preferred him to tezoda and the chief felt very badly because he had such a worthless son-in-law now the parents of the lame girl were anxious to secure tezoda for a son-in-law and as he was willing the wedding took place after which a great feast was to be given to the neighboring tribes tezoda was sent out seal hunting and came back with a canoe loaded down on the morning of the feast he took his bride to a lonesome lake in the mountains and both had a bath they came out of the water looking very differently from what they did when they went in to swim 
the bride's lameness and homeliness were gone and she now was a beauty the groom was also much handsomer than ever when they entered and took their places at the feast they were the wonder and envy of all and the wife of Halak felt more sorry than ever that she had not accepted Tezoda. This was in the first part of the month of March, and shortly after the whole village went to Nass River to get the Ulakan fish. On the way up there is a high rocky point. Tezoda, who wanted still further to shame Halak and his wife, asked Halak to sling a stone at the rock. Halak did so, but the stone fell short in the water then tezoda took his sling and threw a stone which struck the mountain boring a hole through it which can be seen even to this day still further on the way they saw a mountain with copper on the top halak again tried to hit it but his stone fell back into the canoe and struck his mother-in-law who fell into the water where she turned into a salmon and disappeared this was too much for halak who felt so ashamed that he jumped overboard and was lost then Tezoda, with his sling, threw a stone which struck the copper, and knocked it down so that it dropped and broke into twelve coppers. These he carried north. He was the first one who brought these costly media of exchange among the Northland tribes. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Apostle of Alaska – the Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Thraimsham, the Tsimsian Devil. The legendary lore of all primitive people is more or less busy with the devil, or at least with an evil spirit of some sort. The Tsimsian folklore is no exception in this particular in fact their legends are so much occupied with Thraimsham, their devil that one of them told mr duncan that it would take him a whole week should he tell him all the tsimshian legends about Thraimsham. but all the tsimshians seem to have had a clearer conception of him and his true character than most heathen nations have thus it will be seen from the following that their devil like the biblical one fell or was thrown down from heaven their common nickname for him is the father of liars he is voracious and a glutton never gets enough to eat and practically scours the earth seeking what he can devour while he has the power to hop from mountain peak to mountain peak and to hurl a mountainside down into a ravine and to change his appearance and assume gigantic proportions he is utterly unable to do anything useful for himself he cannot catch a fish for himself when he is hungry can only cheat a man out of one by some one of his many frauds tricks and deceits his history according to the tsimsians begins as follows a chief's son had a slave of his own age he grew up to be an expert archer one day he shot a raven skinned it put on the skin and found that he could fly the slave boy wanted to fly also so he shot another raven and taught the slave to fly they flew up into heaven where the great chief gave them each a wife and each of them had a baby boy after a while the great chief wished them to send their boys down to earth to help the people so their fathers dropped them down one fell on land and the other into the sea the latter was the devil when he fell into the water a salmon swallowed him this happened not far from a village where lived a chief whose wife had no children they both wanted children but she did not get any one of her slave women was out fishing with a net and caught a big salmon when she took it ashore to clean it she found the boy in its belly then she put him under the bed of the chief's wife when she awoke during the night she heard the boy cry looked under the bed found him and took him in her arms then the chief adopted him as his own son End of chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of the Apostle of Alaska The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Shemp. Behind the Walls At the request of Governor Douglas, Mr. Duncan, from the time when he first arrived at the fort, read the service of the Episcopal Church for the garrison every Sunday forenoon the inmates seemed to appreciate this service very much 
also the schooling which he gave these grown-up men many of whom could neither read nor write one of them who learned the three r's from mr duncan afterwards became a clerk in his store and his bookkeeper at old metlakatla it was sunday morning some four or five weeks after his arrival as mr duncan returned from his breakfast he saw four or five of the men in their working clothes and with axes on their shoulders he at once went to the second officer asked him what that meant and was informed that the captain had given them orders to go out into the forest and chop wood duncan at once went to his room and wrote a letter to the captain stating what he had heard and seen as to his orders now he continued i have only this to say that if this be so i cannot hold any services in the fort to-day i am no hypocrite and will not take part in any hypocritical service wherein i read from the contempt of thy word and holy commandments and you answer good lord deliver us when you and i both know that you have just broken one of god's commandments therefore if you want any service you will have to read it yourself as i peremptorily decline so to do in ten minutes the captain was at his quarters angry as he could be that was evident every one at the fort knew what it meant when the captain appeared with his cap turned around with the visor in the neck i have received your letter sir i thought when you came that in a short time you would try to run the fort and i see i was right not at all sir i try to run nothing i issue no orders only to myself i must have that right i don't prevent your having a service i simply say i will not take part in it knowing that god's law as to the sabbath is being openly broken i am not the chaplain of your fort and you cannot order me sir well sir i shall certainly report this assumption of authority to the company all right do so i will also make my report and i have no fear of the result the captain angry as he could be ran out slammed the door and shouted to the men you men need not go to work it seems someone else is going to run things in the fort after this the men of course were more than pleased to quit work and all came to the service this one thing i do as soon as mr duncan had arrived at the state where he could to some extent make himself understood to claw he made it a point to go with him around to the houses of the indians his first specific object was to take a census of the people this occupation gave him a chance to meet them in a friendly way and i have no doubt that his face which even then must have beamed like a benediction spoke to them volumes of the white missionary's kindness and love for them whenever he learned of any being sick he welcomed the opportunity to visit them and to try to help them out by some simple advice or once in a while with some medicine from his medicine chest for he had dabbled a little in medicine also thinking it might be of use to him in his missionary work and many a heart was won by the young missionary even before he could make himself understood at all in their language through the kindness and sympathy he showed the sick and by his being able to relieve their suffering by the means at hand it was a puzzle to the indians to know what a white man who was not a trader or a whiskey seller or a debaucher of their women really came among them for many a time must they have put this question to each other and frequently i am told did they inquire of claw when the white man would be able to speak to them one day when mr duncan had been at the fort three or four months he was surprised to see a fine-looking old indian chief enter his room the chief's name was nyashtado he was one of the chiefs of the kitlans and while not the head chief was very much respected by all the indians in the camp the fact that he had three full-grown sons living with him would alone make him very much respected i have heard that you have come here with the letter of god is that so have you the letter of god with you asked the chief i have said mr duncan would you mind showing it to me certainly and mr duncan went into his bedroom and returned with a large bible which he placed on the table this is god's book the indian reverently almost caressingly laid his hand on the bible is god's letter for the tsimsians certainly god sent this book to your people as well as to mine does that book give god's heart to us it does 
are you going to tell the indians that i am um um shimauget it is good it is good chief his coming under the circumstances showed how anxiously some of them were looking for the gospel message they could hardly wait until he was ready to bring it them end of chapter 16chapter seventeen of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the first message finally the great day came when mr duncan after eight months assiduous study had attained such knowledge of their language that he had been able to write out in simshian the first message of the christ to the savage heart the indians had but lately returned from their ulakan fishing trip to the nas river when he was ready for the first time to address them in their own language on saturday morning he sent word to the chiefs of the nine different tribes that he would like to address their people in their respective houses the next day and asked if they would permit him to do so the answer was favorable in every instance and it must have given him much encouragement to notice that not a canoe started out that sunday morning from the settlement every indian man woman and child was anxious to hear what the white chief had come to tell them it was ten o'clock sunday forenoon the thirteenth day of june a d eighteen fifty eight when he started from the fort with his sermon in his pocket and accompanied by claw his language teacher the first house which he entered was that of nyashnawa the head chief of the kitlutsa tribe where he found an audience of about one hundred gathered to hear him it seems almost a dispensation of providence that of all the indian houses at that time located near fort simpson the only one of which any vestige now remains is that very house in which he by god's grace was first allowed to preach the gospel to the tsimsheans the framework of this house as shown in the illustration on a nearby page stands today at fort simpson though its occupants and their descendants long since are gone by actual measurement of the beams and posts now standing it appears that this house was fifty-five feet by sixty-five feet with a height from the ground to the lower edge of the cross beams of a little over fifteen feet the beams and posts are logs of nearly three feet in diameter this was the first indian assembly mr duncan ever faced no wonder that he quailed before the undertaking it required a stout heart for any one with only his limited knowledge of a strange and difficult language to dare lay before this waiting throng the precious gospel message one word improperly used might produce an entirely wrong impression one mispronounced bringing ridicule on the messenger and the message but mr duncan had a stout heart and then he had in addition thereto the wonderful support of an almighty father who did not allow him to yield to the temptation to read his sermon sentence by sentence to claw and have him repeat it to the people when he at the last moment fearing the effect of his faulty pronunciation suggested this course to claw the blanching of the latter's cheeks at once convinced him that things would be liable to go worse than and with a silent prayer to god for help he started in by asking the people to close the door this brought an awe of stillness over the audience which was heightened by mr duncan's kneeling down for a few moments of silent prayer he then gave them the first address they have ever heard from a white man in their own language fortunately i am able to give in english a synopsis of this historical address the original of which in tsimshian is still kept in mr duncan's safe at metlakatla he first introduced himself as a missionary from england who had come from afar over the great seas with the specific object of giving to them the message of god from his book which if they would learn and obey it would bless them in this life and prepare them for the life to come he then reminded them that we do not live here always that the term of our life here is uncertain but though our bodies die our souls do not and proceeded god's book teaches us how we should live in this world and so be prepared for a future life in heaven with god it also teaches us about god that he is holy that he hates every evil way that all men and women are sinners and that our hearts are full of evil 
god made us to love him and follow his ways but the people have forsaken him and followed their own ways which are evil in his sight god's book tells us that god sees all we do knows all that is in our hearts and that when we die every one of us must stand before him to answer for our conduct on earth we cannot hide anything from god nor can we make ourselves good how then can we be saved from the punishment due to our sins and become good the answer to these great questions is given us in god's book and this is the gospel or good news which god has sent you i now urge you to listen to this gospel which is that god so loved and pitied mankind that he sent his only son jesus christ into the world to save us jesus christ suffered and died for our sins he is now in heaven to hear and answer our prayers he bids us put away our sinful ways and look to him to be saved if we obey he will pardon our sins make us holy and take us to live with him in heaven when we die i exhort you not to reject god's message of love reflect on how much god has done to save us put away your evil ways and learn god's ways one thing i ask you to do from this day forth which you can do and which will be pleasing to god refrain from all kind of work on sunday which is the lord's day and meet together on that day to learn god's will and pray to him i have a great deal more to tell you from god's book he has heard what i have told you today believe that god is longing to bless you and to save you the indians were all remarkably attentive when at the conclusion he asked them to kneel down they at once complied and while he offered up a prayer in english they preserved a great silence he then bade them good-bye and went to the house of the head chief of the tsimsheans legaic where everything was prepared a sail spread for mr duncan to stand upon and a mat placed on a box for him to sit upon about one hundred and fifty people had assembled who were by the chief admonished to behave themselves and listen respectfully to what he had to say a few people from the fort being present mr duncan first spoke shortly in english and thereupon repeated his address in tsimshian they all knelt in prayer and were very attentive as at the other place claw upon inquiry assured mr duncan that from their looks he knew that they understood him and felt it to be good after this he went to the other seven chiefs houses in succession and in each repeated his address to a congregation of all the way from fifty to two hundred souls in some of the places where he had an idea that the people did not understand or pay the attention he desired he repeated his address at one house he even repeated it twice when four o'clock came he had without getting any rest or luncheon preached in nine different houses to between eight and nine hundred indians that it was a great beginning of a great good to these people the following pages will show that he had made a good impression on the people was evident from the fact that the head chief legaic offered him the use of his house for a school which he informed them he intended to open at once for the children in the forenoon and for the adults in the afternoon the roll call showed twenty-six children present on the first day and the attendance increased right along still more satisfactory to the teacher was it to notice the attention and interest the scholars seemed to give to their work from the beginning the attendance in the afternoon some fifteen only was not so satisfactory it evidently took some courage for the grown people to go to school the spirit which mr duncan had recognized by not asking the people to hear his message except in their own chief's house soon made itself felt also with reference to the school one chief said to mr duncan you will have all the people to teach as soon as your own house is built this set him to thinking and as legaic when the salmon season came was going away he after a while concluded he had better close his school till he could get a school building erected on july eleventh mr duncan had finished and prepared a second address in tsimshian and proceeded to deliver it in the same way as on the first occasion of all the people present there was only one the chief quithre the head of the cannibal club who refused to kneel when he asked them to do so the angry scowl and the ugly muttering of this chief showed that the medicine men recognized in the new teaching the death knell to their nefarious practices and disgusting deviltry 
they undoubtedly commenced to feel already that a new light was coming over their people which would open their eyes to the falsehood and deceit that so long had been practised upon them and from which these same medicine men had so long managed to make an easy living during the summer months a goodly portion of the indians were away but enough remained to give mr duncan a lift with his school building several had undertaken to cut the logs and raft them over to the beach and now the logs were to be brought up the hill to the place where the school was to be located about the site where the methodist church now stands but this was not to be only a few logs had been brought to the location when an indian assisting in the work fainted and died undoubtedly from some heart trouble any one knowing the indian superstition can appreciate the effect of this naturally any confidence with which mr duncan had inspired them would be shaken and they would be afraid to help any further in the work with a wisdom which seems to be of god and which never all through his life has forsaken him he immediately stopped the work and changed the site to a place whence it would not require such exertion to convey the logs but where on the other hand he put himself right in the path of the enemies of his work as he later on found out he said nothing more about building until september sixteenth the next day he wrote in his diary yesterday i spoke to a few on the subject and all seemed heartily glad one old chief said to me cease being angry now thinking i suppose my delay was occasioned by anger he assured me he would send his men to help this morning i went down to the raft at six a m but only one old man was there in a little time came two or three then a few more then two chiefs by about half past six we mustered seven or eight workers on the raft though several more came and sat at their doors indian-like as though they wished only to look on this seemed greatly in contrast with their expressions to me yesterday but such is the indian i knew it was of no use to push so i patiently waited about seven o'clock one of the indians on the raft sprang to his feet gave the word for starting which is a peculiar kind of a whoop and he with the few so inadequate to do the work determined to begin at this i proceeded up the beach to the building site but what was my surprise when on returning i met upwards of forty indians carrying logs they all seemed to have moved in an instant and sprung to the work with one heart the enthusiasm they manifested was truly gladdening and almost alarming among the number were several old men who were doing more with their spirited looks and words than with their muscles the whole camp seemed now excited encouraging words and pleasant looks greeted me on every side every one seemed in earnest and the heavy blocks and beams began to move up the hill with amazing rapidity when the fort bell rang for breakfast they proposed to keep on one old man said he would not eat till the work was done however i did not think it good to sanction this enthusiasm so far but sent them off to their homes by three o'clock all was over for which i was very glad for the constant whooping groaning and bawling of the indians together with the difficulty of the work from the great weight of the pieces and the bad road kept me in constant fear within a few days the framework was in position and the work of finishing the school building and providing the schoolroom with the necessary desks and benches now proceeded as fast as could be expected mr duncan had intended to buy bark for the roof but the indians saying that the white chief's teaching house ought to have a roof of boards insisted upon donating with a great deal of ceremony and show of good feeling the boards both for the floor and the roofing many who could not otherwise have contributed brought boards from their own houses and even planks which were part of their beds on november seventeenth when the school was first opened his former scholars all rushed eagerly to the new school whither they were called by blows on a triangle of steel used for a bell the attendance proved to be one hundred and forty children and fifty adults many more than he had ever expected or hoped to see there End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schampf. The Devil Abroad. 
these fall months were like the calm before the storms which always rage during the midwinter months in alaskan waters with the month of december commenced the medicine work and the club work with all its abominable and disgusting ceremonies on the first of december the head chief came to the captain of the fort and told him that his young daughter the big finn had gone to the moon for her education and would be back in a month and asked him to persuade mr duncan to suspend his school during that month as it would interfere with their work and he did not like having the children pass by the house going to and from school as it broke the spell of their mysteries if he would do this they would all come to school afterwards but if he did not the medicine men might shoot the children as they were on their way to school now this going to the moon was of course only a put-up game they all know better they simply hide the child away somewhere in the forest for a month when she has disappeared they go around with a mysterious air and sing weird songs a kind of heathenish hysterics comes over the whole camp they pretend to know just when she's coming back the whole tribe is gathered on the beach looking for her when she suddenly appears coming around the point on a raft stark naked they now rush out into the water to take her off the little raft she makes all kinds of funny gestures as if she wanted to get away and go up into the air again they then tie her with a medicine man's rope and butcher a dog she pretends to eat the raw dog meat smears the blood around her mouth and on her breast and arms runs with her arms stretched out and moving them up and down as if she tried to fly around to all the houses in the village followed by the crowd at some house she gets up on the roof with the people after her holding her back from going to the moon again when the captain laid the request of Legaic before mr duncan and asked him to give in to them in this matter his answer was not for a month not even for a day will i stop satan has reigned long enough here it is high time his rule should be disturbed the second officer of the fort should not have said what he did i think you are making a great mistake sir in not giving in to them you do not know what you are doing you ought to respect their superstitions it is likely that bloodshed will come from this well sir said duncan i thank you for your advice which by the way i did not ask you to give i may not know what i am doing but i think you do not know what you are talking about if blood will be shed it will certainly not be yours anyhow i suppose you mean mine but as to my own blood i will be responsible for that sir one thing i know whether blood will be shed or not and i don't believe it will be i never could afford to make a compromise with the devil and i never will that is mr duncan through and through it was his policy in the beginning it has been his policy all through his life it is his policy today no one can move him an inch when he thinks he is right and has laid out his course to follow when the gaic that night came for his answer and found what it was he begged the captain to ask mr duncan to stop for a fortnight anyway but by this time the captain knew better than to run his head up against the stone wall and told the chief it would be of no use to speak to mr duncan about it again the day the girl was coming back the chief's wife hailed mr duncan as he was going into the schoolroom she said the chiefs were all at her house and had sent her to ask him if he could not dispense with the school for just one day no not for an hour the bell does so disturb them could you be so kind as not to ring the bell to-day no i cannot do that if i did not ring the bell the scholars would think there would be no school and would not come well you could ring it softly not so hard no if i ring it at all i will have to ring it as usual so they can hear it she cried and went away seemingly much dejected at the failure of her mission mr duncan struck the steel used for a school bell and says he is inclined to think that if anything the bell was clanging a little more lively that day than usual and no one who knows mr duncan doubts that for a moment only about eighty scholars came to school that day the rest undoubtedly knew what was coming and prudently stayed away nothing happened in the morning but in the afternoon just as school was to commence duncan on looking out of the door there were no windows in this school building noticed several indians coming in single file legaic first they all had their war paint on 
some wore masks when legaic came into the room the children all scampered out of the door the other indians seven in number followed legaic in mr duncan who perhaps guessed what was coming folded his arms and stood immovable at his place legaic first commenced to scold him because he had not obeyed him mr duncan simply answered that he had to obey god more than man and that god looked with anger and disgust on their heathen deviltry at this time some of the other indians evidently taunted legaic who was considerably under the influence of liquor for he now started over closer to mr duncan with an ugly-looking knife in his hand assuring him in the meanwhile that he was a bad man that he had killed men before and that he now had made up his mind to punish him he was brandishing his knife as his companion Kushwat encouraged him by crying kill him cut off his head give it to me and i will kick it on the beach mr duncan who thought his last moment had come threw a glance upward and then looked his intended murderer who towered above the little englishman firmly in the eye as he said yes you are a bad man i know it you would kill me who have done you no harm i who have come here only for your good he noticed that while he was speaking legaic's eyes were turning to the left of him that he seemed to waver in his evident purpose and he was more than surprised when he heard legaic commence to speak abusively to claw on turning to the left he saw claw who had come in without the knowledge of mr duncan standing with his right hand under his blanket a little behind him he then understood that legaic as he came up to kill him had observed claw's coming in and that he from the position well knew that claw had a loaded pistol under his blanket and would shoot him dead the moment he did any harm to mr duncan growling and cursing legaic's followers left when he saw that he also retired well might mr duncan write in his diary that night i have heartily to thank the all-seeing father who has covered me and supported me to-day after legaic had gone mr duncan went out to ring the bell he was surprised to find the children all huddled together under the building the house was built on posts he told them to come in which they did and with them came also an old woman belonging to legaic's tribe duncan was a little nervous after the attack perhaps but nevertheless he distributed the books and was about to commence the instruction when there was a heavy thump against the door which he had just closed he understood perfectly well that this indicated an unfriendly action and expected his last moment had come as he felt sure that legaic had probably been taunted with having come and gone without doing what he said he would do but he nevertheless went to open the door legaic stood outside you said i was a bad man i wanted to show you i was not look at my teapots the tsimsheans were then as all the coast indians are now very anxious to obtain letters or certificates from white men especially officials as to their good character these certificates which they call teapots they value very much and are very prone to show them to visiting whites with whom they come in contact as they are generally unable to read writing sometimes scurvy tricks are played upon them by persons taking advantage of their ignorance i saw one such a teapot handed me in good faith by an old ignorant indian which read as follows this indian is an infernal thief he will steal a red-hot stove look out for him the poor old indian did not look as if he could steal a potato but legaic's teapots were undoubtedly bona fide obtained from the captain of the fort and others they were carefully placed between two pieces of board which were whittled down to the thickness of thick heavy paper he now handed this package to mr duncan no he said i don't care to read your teapots i know you better than the men who gave them but that does not make any difference i have no ill feeling against you i have come here to make you good come in here and sit down and i will help you to be better saying this he took him by the arm as if to lead him in this was too much for the chief with an indignant grunt he disappeared his feeling continued for some time to be of such a hostile nature that in order not to expose the scholars lice to dangerous attacks as they passed his house mr duncan deemed it best to close the school in the schoolhouse and accept the offer of another chief to use his house for a school temporarily 
over one hundred scholars were now in regular attendance the murderous attack of legaic took place five days before christmas on christmas day the scholars at mr duncan's request brought their friends and parents with them to school some two hundred gathered now for the first time did mr duncan attempt to speak to the people without having reduced his ideas to writing the attempt much to his surprise proved to be a complete success he explained to the indians to whom sunday was dress day and christmas day the great dress day why the white people celebrated this day as one of great joy to all people that god's son was born on that day he spoke again of the love of god and his hatred of sin and especially called their attention to the sin of drunkenness amongst men and profligacy amongst women of which they were guilty as he spoke he could see that his words went home to the consciences of many after his sermon he questioned the children on some bible truths which they had learned at school and then they sang two hymns which he had translated into their tongue and which the children had practised in school he accompanying the singing on his concertina thereafter the same kind of services were held in the schoolroom every sunday hymns were sung a short address given a brief catechization of the people on simple truths and then a closing song and prayer and this less than seven months after the indians had for the first time in their lives heard the gospel message End of chapter eighteen